Welcome back to the channel, everybody. I'm Dino. If you've been watching my channel for a while, you'll know that most of my channel focuses around sort of repairing and servicing power sports, specifically my Suzuki DR650 and my Skidoo 900 Enduro Ace. However, the last video that I put out, one of my subscribers, MalJ1978, asked if I could do an episode on the type of camera equipment and equipment in general that I use to film my videos. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. So why don't you sit back, grab yourself something cold to drink, and enjoy Dino's Tinker Shed. I'll see you in a few minutes. <laughs> One of the first things that I thought about when I decided to get into this kind of uh, content creation was really what content and what platforms were my plans? What, were, what was I going to shoot for basically? Was TikTok part of it? Was cinema quality video productions part of it? Or was I just going to basically stick to YouTube? And for me it was really just about sticking on to YouTube. I didn't really have any plans to branch out at that point and even today a year and a half later I really don't have any plans at this point to branch out into other platforms. Now that's a good thing to know. You can match your camera purchases to the quality of video output that you need. Now YouTube does take 4K videos. You can upload 4K quality videos to YouTube. But if you really look at it the platform still is primarily 720 and 1080. That's really what you're shooting for, your video quality. Buying a fancier camera, well, although it's good, isn't necessary if you're just starting out. And that's exactly what I did. And I'll talk about that a little bit later in terms of what my first cameras were for this channel. However, 4K does give you some advantages even if you're uploading in 1080. The advantage for me is a 4K camera allows me to digitally zoom in and get a few different shots in post where I can edit it and maybe zoom in and that and still get some really high quality and high clarity even if I didn't have the camera set up the way I wanted it. It wasn't framed quite right. And that's another consideration. I pretty much shoot all my videos by myself. Right now, you're sitting on a tripod. I don't have a camera crew. Even when my friend Carl comes over, I primarily shoot on a tripod. So I set it up. I look in the, the viewfinder here, set up and frame the shot. And then in post, sometimes I'll zoom in a little bit or zoom out a little bit, depending on how the, the frame actually turned out. It's not perfect, but a 4K camera has a much denser data stream or whatever and you're a lot, you can actually zoom in a little bit and get away with it more than you could if you were shooting in native 1080 or 720 is even worse. Those are the types of considerations that you need to think about before you even start looking for a camera. You need to know what your ultimate output is going to be. Now that I knew I was mostly going to focus on YouTube, I took an inventory of what I had, which was pretty basic. Again, I had a LG Stylus 3 and, an, and a Coolpix Nikon camera, like a point and shoot camera. I was able to borrow some better equipment from friends and family. Most notably, my friend Carl provided me with a Nikon 5600 with a zoom lens that was my primary camera, probably from the first nine months of filming this channel. My daughter and my son-in-law also provided some great camera equipment. My son-in-law provided me with a pair of GoPros, which I used in the beginning for both ride videos and close-up sort of footage, sort of as a third camera for B-roll. And my daughter ended up buying me an Insta360 X2 for Father's Day last year, 
which was a great camera and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But overall, I guess the point here is you don't necessarily have to own a lot of equipment to get your channel up and running. And if you have good relations with friends and family, you can borrow camera equipment. And, it, and quite often, they're quite excited to lend it to you because they want to see you succeed. That was definitely the case with my friends and family. And there's even a third option. If you go through um, like Facebook Marketplace, oftentimes you can find camera equipment for rent. So if you just want to shoot specific videos maybe once a month, you can try different pieces of equipment by renting it and then it'll tell you whether or not that piece of camera equipment is right for you. Why don't we start and take a look at my primary camera, the one that you're watching right now. And then I'll run through the different pieces of camera equipment that I have and maybe some of the accessories, not all of them, but uh, some of them anyway. Okay, let's get going now. When I started looking for a new primary camera, I initially started looking at a newer DSLR, similar to what Carl had, or maybe something that would even shoot in 4K, which would allow me to crop the images with good clarity in post. Now, DSLRs and mirrorless cameras have some really good advantages. Pretty much the biggest advantage is the size of their sensors. DSLRs in particular have a very large image sensor, and that gives you great picture quality, but it also gives you the ability to blur the background and give you that bokeh look that many cinematographers really, really like. Now, the other advantage is they use interchangeable lenses, which means for close-up macros or telephotos, you can find a lens that suits your needs. The challenge that I had with DSLRs was twofold. One is they do shoot much better on auto than they did in the past. And from what I understand, even since Carl's camera, they've improved immensely, but they still can be a little bit more challenging for an amateur cinematographer like myself. The next challenge is cost. Many of the more modern DSLRs and mirrorless cameras are skyward of $1,500 Canadian just for the camera body. Now, when you start adding on a portrait lens and maybe a zoom lens, it crests $2,000 to $2,500 very quickly. So I also looked at video cameras. Now, video cameras really don't get the love that they used to. They've sort of been taken over by those DSLRs and mirrorless cameras. However, when I really started to do some research, I realized that video cameras probably suit the style of shooting that I do much better than a DSLR or mirrorless could ever provide. The nice thing about these are they're a one-stop shop. This has a nice 20 times zoom lens optically and then a 30 times zoom lens if you include the digital enhancements. So I can zoom in very close with this the same as I could with most zoom lenses on a DSLR. The other nice thing about these is their autofocus works really, really well. They've had a lot of years to tune these and get them to work right. And the fact that they do have a smaller image sensor means that they tend to stay in focus a little more. You don't get that nice background blur, but I really wasn't interested in that anyway because I'm shooting mostly instructional videos. This particular camera is a Sony AX53 and I settled on this for a couple reasons. One is it's a true 4K camera. That gives me that really dense data rich uh, image that I can crop and post and get some different image angles from the same shot. It got great reviews and also the image stabilization is handled by both digital enhancement, but more importantly, it has an actual gimbal built in behind the lens cap here and stabilizes it with that gimbal as you move around. To maximize the use of that, I put this top handle, this grab handle on top here, it was like $29, and it allows me to basically take the camera off and now I can shoot by hand, low or high, and get really good stabilized images when I wanna use this as a run and gun type camera. 
Also, it does have a microphone jack on it. And I use this pretty much exclusively, even though the camera itself does come with a reasonably good microphone built in. The idea of using this wireless lavalier microphone has improved my audio quality quite a bit. And the nicest thing about these cameras is they have very good battery life and they basically will run until they either run out of batteries or they fill up your SD card. They don't overheat similar to what say a DSLR would. So that is my primary camera right here, the Sony AX53. Why don't we look at my second camera? With the Sony as now my primary camera, I started using Carl's camera just as my B-roll camera. So whenever you see shots from above, for the longest time, that was Carl's Nikon camera that was doing that. The manual focus worked really well at getting things uh, sort of sharp and crisp, unless I lifted things off the desk, and then you would probably see it would get out of focus because I was using a manual focus lens on that. After a while, I decided I really wanted to get a dedicated B-roll camera and get his back into his hands. So after shopping around for a while, I settled on locating a Canon HFR 700, which you see here. Now this camera shoots in 1080. It has a very nice little lens. And I got this one used for $150 with three batteries, the charger, all of the accessories and it was in really good condition. The nice thing about it is it's it's actually the video quality isn't too bad. In fact, I used this camera to shoot the Sony uh, clips that you watched before this. It does have built-in microphones, but it also has a microphone input jack, which is nice. The only challenge is you need to use a, uh, an amplified microphone, a powered microphone. It has absolutely no ability for phantom power, so you need to actually have something that's amplified. So this Tackstar microphone works really good. Now, I have used Rode microphones before, which I borrowed from my friend Harold. This Tackstar works very well. It's a directional shotgun mic, and mounted in this fashion, it works really, really well. So I just mount them on the, on the tripod, opposed to each other, and it works really good. So that's my camera that I use for overhead shots and some B-roll shots. And I'm gonna take this camera with me when I go on riding trips because I can store it in my tail box and I can pull it out and use it with that really high quality 53 times zoom, I think it is, to get some really decent photos. So that's my Canon um, HFR 700, and that's my B-roll camera. My third camera, again, is this Insta360. And I use this camera for time-lapse shots inside the shop here, and sometimes with um, my introductions. So if I'm walking and I'm looking around like that, that's the Insta360. I do find the built-in microphones aren't really the best, but when you're out, say, on a, on a, a ride or something like that, it doesn't work too too bad and it does give you that perspective that um, you don't get from other video cameras now again it shoots in 5.7k it does have a built-in touch screen and i personally like it better than the gopros i've used like i say other gopros but that's only because i'm used to it why don't i show you a little bit of the kind of footage that i get with this insta360 as I said, and if I'm walking like this, this is often the camera that I'm going to use because it's very flexible and it's very image stabilized. But this camera does a lot of different tricks. Like I said, it's good for time lapse, but it can also do things like bullet time. So bullet time is sort of a feature that Insta360 has. I don't really use it all that much, but you can kind of see the way it works here. Now, what I use this mostly for is ride videos now and the fact that you can sit here and actually move the camera around in post. So I'm going to stand like this and you can look around my entire yard and it'll come all the way back to see me. Now again, the nice thing about the Insta360 is when you put it on a selfie stick like this, well, the selfie stick disappears 
you don't actually see it. So it can give you some really neat shots. It's really good for booming and crane shots like this, where you can see that my east drops probably need cleaning. But it's also really good for unique shots that you can't get with just about any other camera. Things like flying over top of these daisies here. Now, pretty much any drone could do that kind of a shot. And the Insta360 can actually fit in place of a drone. But what's neat about the Insta360 is its ability to get into places that a drone can't necessarily. Why don't we fly through this magnolia canopy here? And if that isn't quite tight enough for you, well, we can even do better than that. We can do things like maybe fly through these ladder rungs here. So the Insta360 is a great tool for the creative side of your channel. And it does do really good when I use it for my ride videos because I can recrop the frame any way that I want. So this is my number three camera. I use one more camera and let me show you that now. My fourth camera that I use on most videos is, believe it or not, this. This is my trusty old cell phone, but it's not the LG that I talked about. One thing I found out about the Insta360 is in order to activate it, it needs to pair with a cell phone. And that cell phone needs to be a 64-bit processor in order for the camera to even activate. Once the camera's activated, you actually don't need the, the phone anymore. It'll run on its own. You can start it and stop and take videos. But the initial activation of the, cam of the camera requires it to pair with a 64-bit phone. Now, if you remember earlier, I talked about needs versus wants. Well, I would love to go out and buy a brand new 64-bit processor phone, but they range anywhere from $1,000 all the way up to $2,700 for some of the new iPhones and Samsungs. Now, I talked with my friend Harold, who I told you was, was uh, in this industry for a lot of years, and he's actually the one who told me, buy a really good phone, it'll help you out. His recommendation was actually to buy a used Google Pixel phone. And I ended up buying and still using a Google Pixel 3XL. So it's a three generation old phone, but it does use a 64-bit Snapdragon processor. Now, I know that iPhones and Samsungs tend to get the most renowned for their video quality. However, Google, I think, has the most advanced software that works on the Android platform for their photography and for their video quality. I use this phone for all of my slow motion shots, and I have right from the beginning when I bought it to pair up to the Insta360. It does slow motion really well. Now, it only shoots in 1080. It doesn't shoot in 4K like the new phones. But again, I'm only filming for um, YouTube, so 1080 is fine. And I don't tend to crop the footage from this because I shoot the slow motion um, really close to the bike or to the parts that I'm working on. So quite often, it is exactly what I want it to look like. The other thing that I use this phone for is my thumbnail images. It does a really good job of processing still frame images. And I think better than just about anything on the market. In fact, my daughter, my son-in-law, and my wife traded their iPhones and Samsungs in to buy Pixels after they played with this phone for a while. So that has worked for me for over a year now, probably 12 months. In fact, I killed my first Pixel phone that I bought used on a snowmobile trip. It was raining. I obviously didn't have it waterproofed enough. Got back to the hotel and I had killed it. Tried to fix it, couldn't do it. 
but believe it or not, I found a brand new in-box sealed Pixel XL on Amazon for $249, brand new. So I've got a real workhorse here for a quarter of the cost of what a new Pixel phone is worth. And that's probably what I would leave you with most about the cameras is you don't have to buy brand new and you don't have to buy the fanciest thing to make videos on YouTube. At least that's my experience. Now, there are better cameras that will absolutely outperform what I have in the shop here. But for what I do, I think the video quality is pretty good, but let me know in the comments what you think. I think it's important too to take a quick look at maybe some of the accessories that I'm using to make these videos. We'll take a look at maybe the hardware, and then I want to show you the software that I use as well if you're still interested. So stick around. One of the first accessories that I actually received was when I received my Insta360 camera. And it came as a bundle with both its Insta360 selfie stick, which is a really high quality, well-made selfie stick. It's got a quarter 20 uh, threaded nut or bolt on the top here, as well as a receiving nut on the bottom. And it's all metal. It's really well made. It's probably heavier than some selfie sticks but it works very well with the camera and it's very stable when it's out at full extension. This also comes in a carbon fiber 10 foot selfie stick that I mentioned earlier, and it's really good for crane shots. I don't have one of those. I borrow one occasionally from my friend, but right now I just have the four foot unit. This tripod also came with the Insta360. Now you can use that for vlogging. It has, again, a quarter 20 stud on top here, and it also has a quarter 20 stud on the side. The reason for that is this can actually be attached to the selfie stick on the side like this. The camera gets attached out here, and then you can spin it like this. This is used for what Insta360 calls bullet time. Now also this, this little vlogging rod here is also a nice little tripod. And because you can thread the Insta selfie stick on top, it'll reach up almost four feet with pretty good stability all the way along there. So I pretty much pack this unit in my bike anytime I go and I even use it for filming inside the studio here itself in the Tinker Shed. On top of the Tackstar shotgun microphone that I'm using right now to do the sound on the uh, Canon video camera, I also purchased um, a single wireless lavalier mic from, from TriDAC here. And this was around $45. I really found that sound quality is probably the most challenging thing I have to deal with. I have shotgun microphones, I've bought several different types. I never was really satisfied with the speaking into the camera if I was any more than maybe a foot or so away from the shotgun mic. This inexpensive wireless microphone really does work well. It's, it's obviously not professional quality, there's a few really weird quirks with it. However, uh, basically, I can clamp this onto the cold shoe of my primary camera and very easily pair these two devices. I hide this underneath my shirt and the sound quality is much, much better. It's a deeper, more robust sound and I can walk further away from the camera without the audio levels changing, which saves me a lot of work in post when I go to edit the audio. Most people will tell you audio is the hardest thing to get right, and I struggle, really, really struggle with it, with my videos to get it all equalized nicely and sounding high quality. So for under $50, this was, a, I think, a good purchase. Recently, I actually purchased one of these, and what this is is a camera slider. It allows you to make those panning, smooth panning shots across... Um, an object that you want to film. The way this works is you mount whatever camera you want on this quarter 20 stud. In this case, I actually have a ball head on this one. 
and then you loosen this knob and the whole carriage slides smoothly along these aluminum rails. I believe it probably uses the same kind of needle bearings that say a, um, a compound miter saw would use. But it really does allow you to, to make it much smoother as your hands aren't so, you know, aren't so steady as maybe they used to be. They do make these motorized so you can set it and it will pull it perfectly at the same speed all the way in front of an object. This one is not motorized, it's used and I found it on Amazon for $25 Canadian. Used equipment is a fantastic thing and it allows you to buy into some of this stuff without spending an arm and a leg anyway. So it's kind of fun. You don't need this, but it does add to your repertoire of potential shots that you can make. One um, tool that I use or accessory that I use is this, and it's kind of an odd thing that I don't know if everybody uses these or not, I don't know, but what this is, is it is actually a dog training clicker. So they use this, or I used to use these when we trained our cattle dog. So you'd say, sit. And they would they would learn that click was a was a command basically. But what I use this for is when I want to synchronize two cameras. So here I have the overhead shot, and if I look over here, it's synchronized with this microphone. The way this works is I'll call out the um, the scene, the take, and then I'll click this three times like this. Actually, I'll show you right here. This is scene two, using a dog clicker, take three. One of the great things about riding the DR650 is it's inexpensive and a fun bike to ride. What this does in post is it allows me to actually line up the audio tracks and that way it synchronizes the two cameras so I can either talk down here or I can just look over here into this camera and the audio quality is the same everything lines up I can use one of the audio tracks whichever one is best but still have everything sync up and it makes it seamless in post and that's what I use this for Hollywood movie producers use those clappers, those boards that clap together and they write the scene and everything on it. I probably someday will make one of those, but for now, this works pretty good and they're cheap. I think you can buy five of these online for like 10 bucks. They're pretty, pretty inexpensive. That's kind of what I use inside the studio here for most of my static shots. When it does come to action shots or mounting cameras inside the studio in places that a tripod really doesn't work, I turn to a couple different methods. The first one and probably the primary one that I use are these magic arms that come from small rig and you can get these on Amazon or other different places, but they're all aluminum, they're all metal. They have these beautiful clamps with rubber, rubber feet inside that allow you to mount these anywhere on your motorcycle and they're really secure. Anywhere there's a pipe you can clamp on, so your handlebars, maybe your subframe, even in some cases I've mounted it to suspension components, but they do move around. The nice thing is you can clamp these really, really tight and then you can put on your action camera, so in this case my Insta360. And they lock in really, really durably because of that quarter 20 mount on them. Then you can move these around, or it's almost like a wet noodle, until you lock it down here. And then they become really, really rigid. Now I use these inside the shop as well here on these posts that I've made out of three quarter inch black pipe and flanges. And I mount them all over the shop here so I can clamp my Insta360 anywhere I want around the shop or my B-roll camera, that small little cannon. It'll fit on here really, really well. I do have smaller ones like this that I'll mount shotgun microphones on, put them around the room, and then I'll just use cables to connect that to my different cameras. 
if I'm using something like my truck where I need to fasten a, an action camera to the truck, I'll use a suction cup mount. And I just have a quarter 20 adapter to fit onto my Insta360. And that's how I get most of my rolling shots that you see out there. Occasionally, I will ride next to Carl with the Insta360 on the selfie stick. And you can actually move it around as if it was a drone and get those kinds of action shots just with a selfie stick and an Insta360. Because you don't need to aim the camera, you can do all of your editing in post and get the shots that you absolutely want. So we'll just lay this out so that we measure everything off of the, off of the center line. Right. Editing is as important or maybe even more important than the footage that you shoot on your cameras. What I use is pretty basic probably, but I'll share with you what I'm doing here in the, sh in the editing room, which is used to be our office, but now it's pretty much dedicated for the, for the channel. I started with looking at what kind of computer I needed. You need to have the fastest computer that you can buy. So I bought a Dell um, gaming computer, which, which is uh, got 16 gigs of RAM. It's got a fairly fast i7 processor in it. It runs my software really, really well. Now for software, there's all kinds of video editing software out there. Probably one of the most popular is Adobe. And my daughter actually uses Adobe when she edits photos or videos. I got kind of intrigued with another product that competes with it. And that product is made by Blackmagic and it's called DaVinci Resolve. I'm using DaVinci Resolve 17 and it is an absolutely fantastic program. It's a professional level software for editing. So you can use this to actually make professional Hollywood grade movies with this. The interesting thing about it is the cost. Now there's two versions. There is a paid version, which is I think a little under $500 Canadian, which you only have to buy once. There's no subscription every year. It's a one-time purchase. And then they have a free version, and that's the version that I use. Now, it is probably 85 to 90% the same as the paid version. It just lacks some of the um, graphic speed processing. I think it, the professional version uses your computer a little more efficiently. And some of the transitions and things are missing from the free version. However, I have never found it to be limiting. DaVinci Resolve allows you to edit both your audio, your color grading, you can add special effects. It does all of your cuts and edits and it does even all of your inventory for all of your, your clips. So it, it's a, just an absolutely fantastic program. What I've heard from others is it might be a little more challenging to learn initially than Adobe. But for me, that was part of the fun was learning how to use it. And you can't beat the price. Everyone asks me, how does, how does Blackmagic sell it or give it away for free? And I suppose the reason is, is Blackmagic really is more of a hardware company from what I can see. They sell mixing boards and studio boards to professional cinema uh, producers, as well as cameras, um, both uh, all the way down to 4K, but many of them are, are cinema level kind of quality cameras. And, and so I think they produce the software to support their hardware, and that's why they can give it away for free. Now, in terms of voiceover, when you hear me sort of talking over top of the actual clip. What I use is a Zoom H4N voice recorder. And this is a professional studio grade four channel recorder that does stereo recording. Now it's a standalone unit, but I do use it with a small shotgun mic on a boom here so I can get a little bit further away from the computer when I'm doing the voiceover. I'll do multiple voiceovers quite often for a segment. So I might have five, six, maybe even sometimes 10 voiceovers before I find one that I like for each segment. And I'll just import it into DaVinci Resolve and lay it down on the audio track line. It's really easy and it's a lot of fun to do. It makes it simple. Now the H4N, 
I think you can still buy them. They're an older unit. I think they're around 300 Canadian now to buy a new one. I bought this one used for $150 and it's done everything that I want. And that's it. Okay, that pretty much summarizes the equipment that I use to make videos for my YouTube channel, Dino's Tinker Shed. Now, in total, if I was to add up everything that I've purchased in the last year for this channel, it's probably going to be somewhere close to $7,000, maybe even closer to ten dollars if I really added it up. And that includes the computer, the sound recorder system that I use, all of the camera equipment, the tripods, all of that. But you don't have to spend that much. There are some amazing YouTube videos out there that are shooting on a really high quality cell phone and they make amazing videos. So you don't have to get overwhelmed with gear. In fact, you can go overboard with gear really, really easily. The only reason I have so many cameras is because I shoot at multiple angles and I need to have the clarity up close for some of the shots that I do in not macro but really close up shots that I want to make sure are clear for you. So I'm constantly upgrading equipment to try and make both the picture quality and the audio quality better for you as a viewer. So I say go out there and shop wisely. Don't be afraid to look for used equipment. Just make sure that that used equipment meets the needs that you're looking for. Many people are constantly upgrading to the most modern equipment thinking that's what's going to make their channel stand out. And my opinion, and my opinion only, is your content is what should separate you from other people on YouTube and make your channel something people want to watch. So be creative. Buy the best equipment that you can, but don't put yourself in hawk just to get the most modern camera that's available out there. Shop wisely. So I had a real blast today making this video. It's kind of a different type of video for me. It was a lot of fun. I get to show you a little bit of behind the scenes on how I make my videos. And if you liked it, by all means, leave a comment. Let people know what your thoughts are because this equipment is what was right for me, but not necessarily what's right for everyone. So please leave a comment and let others know what your experiences are and what you use when you make your videos. Now, if you really liked it, by all means, please like the video and subscribe if you find it entertaining. And that way I get to come and visit you more frequently. YouTube will let you know when I'm coming. But until then, I'm going to put all of this camera equipment away because I can't believe what a mess it is in here right now with cameras all over the place. But I'm looking forward to seeing you soon here on Dino's Tinker Shed. You have yourself a great day. I'll see you soon.